So I am a city girl. I grew up in the city my entire life. I grew up most of my childhood in St. Louis, Missouri, across the state. And I've lived most of my adult life here in the Kansas City area. And so I know nothing about farms. I know nothing about animals. I know nothing about any of that sort of thing. I even asked Nick, he, he grew up in Nebraska. So I just assume like, you live in Nebraska, you probably know more about animals. And I said this week, I was writing the sermon, I said, hey Nick, what's the difference between sheep and goats? Is there a difference between sheep and goats? Like I'm legitimately asking him this question and he's like, yeah, Shannon, there's, there's a difference between sheep and goats. It's like the difference between donkeys and, and horses. And I was like, oh, okay. Great, thanks. And then I'm like, what's the difference between donkeys and horses? <laughs> so I am admittedly, uh, I, I know nothing about, about farm animals, anything like that. But I'll tell you who know, the people who know a lot about sheep are the Irish. Because when Randy and I, Randy's my husband, this year we celebrated our 10 year anniversary Thank you, thank you. And we took a, a dream vacation to Ireland. And everywhere you go in Ireland, you're driving around the countryside and you see all these sheep just grazing around the countryside. Yes, we've got a beautiful picture here. And that's just a very typical scene that you see in Ireland, just sheep just grazing along the pastures. It's very picturesque, it's very like, beautiful, and you see all these sheep. Yes, it's beautiful. So I learned a few facts about sheep for you guys. So you guys ready for some Irish sheep facts? You ready? Yeah. Ireland sheep fact number one, there are more sheep than people in Ireland. It's crazy. There, according to the 2016 census, there are 5.2 million sheep compared to 4.8 million people living in Ireland. Crazy, I know. Fact number two, most of those Irish sheep are actually Scottish. <laughs> They're, uh, the most popular breed is the Scottish black faced sheep, which is a white sheep with black faces and they're very fluffy, they're very wooly. Irish sheep fact number three, wool is the primary product that comes from these sheep and it's a big export of Ireland. So lots of scarves and blankets and hats and sweaters, they call sweaters jumpers though in Ireland. So if you're going to Ireland or England and you're like, I want a sweater, you call it a jumper. Fun fact. So lots of sheep in Ireland. We also learned, so you see this picture, keep that picture on here. We also learned that a lot of farmers paint their sheep red. So that's not blood. I know it looks like really creepy. But that's actually spray paint. You know why they do this? So they don't lose their sheep. Sheep tend to wander off. So each farmer in Ireland has a certain color or a certain pattern that they paint their sheep so that if the sheep wander off or if they get loose, they know that's my sheep and they can go around and they collect all the sheep that are theirs. And it's true, you'll see these sheep just wandering around. So like we were driving down the road and there's sheep just wandering around. They just let them roam free because sheep are kind of dumb and they get loose a lot and they wander off. It's true though, guys. And you just, you gotta go out and find them and you have to figure out which sheep are yours and which sheep are like Farmer Bob's sheep down the street. And so you go and you find the sheep that are marked with your color and you collect those and then you go return Farmer Bob's sheep that are painted blue to his farm down the street. Now the Irish people are pretty into sheep. But you know, the Bible talks a lot about sheep too. So we have this verse here and it's Isaiah 53, six. It says, like sheep, we had all wandered away, each going its own way. I'm like, well, that's not very nice. Sheep aren't the smartest animals and I don't necessarily wanna be compared to a sheep, but it's true, like sheep, we sometimes make poor choices and we sometimes decide that we think we know what's best for our lives 
and we decide to wander off and we decide to go a different path than what God wants for our lives. That's what Pastor Wendy talked about two weeks ago. And when we think we know what's best for our lives and we choose our own paths, we call that sin. And so like sheep, we have all wandered off and we thought we know best and we've chosen our own path that is different than God's good and perfect path for our life. But there's good news. That good news is Jesus. That's what Todd talked about last week. Because Jesus came along to show us that we don't have to live this way anymore and that there's a different way we can live. Jesus came to model a life of love for us. Jesus came to show us that, hey, there's a different way of life that we can live. And then we have this verse that Jesus said about himself. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We're the sheep, Jesus is the good shepherd. He says this as well. I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and they know me. So here's the good news. We wander off, but Jesus is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep that he knows so well, and we know him. We may be the dumb sheep that choose our own paths and think we know best for our lives, but the good shepherd calls us back. The good shepherd says, I know these sheep, and I know that they sometimes make poor choices, but I love them, and I'm gonna lay down my life for them, and I'm gonna care for them, and I'm gonna make a way for them to be back in good relationship with God the Holy Father. So that's what we're talking about today. The relationship restored. Jesus, the good shepherd, making a way for us to be in right relationship with God the Father again. So like I said, the Bible talks a ton about sheep. I I mean, like Israel is probably like Ireland where it's just like sheep are everywhere. So we have this other story about a shepherd and his sheep. It's another story of Jesus. It's a parable. Parable just means like a story that Jesus told that had a deeper meaning than just the surface level meaning. So we're told in Luke 15 that Jesus told them this parable. Suppose someone among you has 100 sheep and lost one of them. I'm guessing that's pretty common based on what I saw in Ireland. Sheep were just wandering off everywhere. Suppose someone among you has 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he is thrilled and he places it on his shoulders. And when he arrives home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, celebrate with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their hearts and lives. So this is the deeper meaning of this parable. Jesus, as this good shepherd, goes out searching for this one lost sheep that has wandered off and gone astray, just like that verse in Isaiah says. Now, as far as I can tell, this sheep has made no effort to return home. This sheep has found some great patch of green grass and is just chomping away and having a great time. We have no proof to show that this sheep has had a change of heart, has looked at his watch and said, you know what, it's getting pretty late. Maybe I should return home to the pasture. Shepherd might be worrying about me. We have no proof that the sheep has asked for forgiveness or has tried to change his dumb sheep-like ways. But Jesus, the good shepherd, goes out after the sheep, tracks it down, puts the sheep on his shoulders, and brings it back home. And he is thrilled to do it. That's the word that the Bible uses, thrilled to do so. Guys, this is what reckless love looks like. That's why I asked Nick and the band to play that song. Because this is what Jesus does for each and every one of us. Tracks us down, chases us down, 
puts us on his shoulders, is thrilled to do so, brings us back home. It gives me goosebumps even just thinking about it. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. That's a reckless thing to do. I mean, I've seen pictures of the Israelite desert and, and wilderness. It's rocky. It's barren. You go out there after dark, you could hurt yourself. You could twist an ankle. This sheep maybe got himself or herself into like a ravine or a canyon. It could have been very dangerous for the shepherd. Doesn't matter. Reckless love chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And this is the best part. We didn't do anything to earn it. We didn't do anything to deserve it. God's still coming after us. It's overwhelming. It's reckless. There's a word that we use to describe all of this. That word is grace. Grace is that love and kindness from God that we didn't do anything to earn, we didn't do anything to deserve, and we get it anyways. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And in the Methodist church, we love grace so much that we don't talk about it just one way. We have three ways to talk about grace. And we're gonna talk about that today. Three ways to talk about grace. We think it's such a big deal that not one simple explanation or definition is gonna cut it. We gotta have three. So the first of those is one called prevenient grace. Let's all say that together. Prevenient grace. It's a big word, prevenient. No, not a lot of people know what it means. Basically it means it's this grace that God gives us before we even knew about God, before we even became a Christian. I'm guessing that there was a point in your life where you had some realization of God. Even if you grew up in, your, in the church your whole life, there was some point where you had an awareness of God. But God had grace for you even before that moment came. That's like at the very beginning of the song, Reckless Love, there's a line that said, before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life into me. That's like what prevenient grace is all about. Before we even knew about God, before we even had an existence of God, God loved us. And God was calling out to us. Think about it this way. In the story of the shepherd putting his sheep, putting the sheep on his back and carrying it home, prevenient grace is the grace that happened before the sheep realized it was even lost. So I'm, I'm picturing the sheep, and again, he, sheep are kind of not the smartest animal, and he probably doesn't even realize he's lost. He's just like wandering off like, oh, this grass looks great. I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to eat it. And the grace was what happened. The prevenient grace was what happened when God was protecting it from getting hurt. Prevenient grace was what was happening when God was protecting it from getting, falling off a cliff or dying or something like that. Prevenient grace was what alerted the shepherd to realize that one of his sheep was missing in the first place. Prevenient grace was what guided the shepherd to be able to find the sheep and bring it back home. All of that was happening without the sheep even realizing it. That was prevenient grace. Or another way to think about it is this. Prevenient grace is that voice of God calling out to us before we're even aware of God's presence in our lives. Because God is constantly, continually reaching out to us, all we have to do is reach back and grab on to the good shepherd who's reaching down to get us. This is verse in Acts that's on the screen. This is Paul talking and he says, God made the nations, that's all of us. God made the world. God made people so that we would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far from any of us. In God, we live and move and exist. So that's the first type of grace. It's prevenient grace, the grace we get before we even 
are aware of God. The next type of grace is one called justifying grace. And this is the kind of grace that happens when we make a conscious decision to reach back out and grab on to God or the good shepherd as he's reaching down to get us. It's called justifying grace and it's the grace that comes when we choose to be in a relationship with God and we ask God to forgive our sins. Pastor Ashley, our high school pastor, she put it like this. Prevenient grace is like the tap that God taps on our shoulders and says, hey, I'm here. And justifying grace is when we turn around and answer back to that tap. It's called justifying grace, and I kind of, this is like the how I remember it, because it's the type of, type of grace that makes it just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never made that decision to wander off in the first place. There's a passage in Psalms that says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God's removed our sins. Just as if they'd never been there in the first place. Justifying grace. I'm actually going to use a different story to talk about what justifying grace looks like. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because I want you to do that in your small groups when we break in a few minutes. And it's another parable that comes just a few verses on after the parable of the good shepherd or the, the lost sheep. It's a pretty famous story. It's called the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son. Essentially, this man has two sons and the younger son makes some bad decisions. Again, kind of like the sheep, he thinks he knows what's best for his life, and he goes down a path that's not so great. He, he makes some bad decisions, and he falls into a life that's pretty hard and pretty messed up. He wastes all his money, and he finds himself in a, in a, without a job, without any food, and he's starving, and he decides, I'm going to go back home and ask for my father's forgiveness and at the lowest point of this life, we, it says that he came to his senses and decides to ask for his father's forgiveness. And we have this verse. While he was still a long way off from home, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then his son says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. So he's, he's turning around to accept the grace but the father said to his servants, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because the son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This is grace. Here, go back to that last slide. This is grace, but more importantly, this is justifying grace because the son had a moment when he came to his senses and said, I got to accept this free gift of grace that my father is going to offer me if I just have to accept it. He realized he had made a mistake. He realized he had wandered too far off the path and he made a choice to come back to his father's house. And then the best part of the story is before he can even get the words out of his mouth, he has this whole big speech prepared that he's going to give his father. And before he can even get the whole speech out of his mouth, his father's like, done, you're forgiven, it's over, let's go party. That's justifying grace. And all we have to do to accept that grace is just, to, is just say, I'm in, I accept it. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We just have to accept it. It's a free gift. So we have prevenient grace and we have justifying grace, but there's a third type of grace that we often overlook, and it's called sanctifying grace. And that's the grace that draws us into a deeper relationship with God and helps us look more like Jesus each day. So when we've said yes to God, when we have turned around to God and said, I'm in, let's do this. I want to be in a relationship with you. It doesn't stop there. In fact, that's actually where the, just, where the fun begins. Because sanctifying grace helps draw us into a deeper and deeper relationship with God each and every day. We get to grow into the kind of people that God longs for us to be. People of love and kindness and compassion. Sanctifying grace is the grace that allows us to follow after our good shepherd from here on out. 
There's another really famous passage that has to do with sheep that I think you all probably know. It's the 23rd Psalm. And it's gonna be on the screen and I'd like us to read it all together. This is from the CEB version, which is the version your Bibles are. So it may sound a little bit different than the versions you have heard growing up. But I want you to think about this in a way that looks like you following after the shepherd all the days of your life. After you've said, yes, I'm gonna follow you, after you have been lost but now found, what does it look like from here on out? So let's read this together. You ready? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. So he guides me in proper paths. So now that I'm back on track, I've been put on the good shepherd's shoulders and I'm now following back on the right path. Sanctifying grace is what keeps me back on the path all the days of my life. So prevenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. We're all like sheep. We wander off. We make dumb choices. We think we know best. We follow our own paths. We hurt ourselves. We hurt those around us. We break the heart of Jesus, our good shepherd, and God, our father. But the good news is that the good shepherd doesn't leave us alone doesn't leave us out there in the wilderness wandering around to be forgotten. Just like those, sh those shepherds in, in Ireland mark their sheep with that spray paint, Jesus has marked us and claimed us as his own all the days of my life. Through prevenient grace, he is calling out after us, constantly pursuing us with relentless love, always chasing us down, never stopping until we are found and return home safe and sound. Through justifying grace, he doesn't just leave us in our sin, but he provides a way for us to be in right relationship with God once again, just as if we had never sinned. As far as the east is from the west, so as far away as that is from that, never to be seen again, we are removed from our sins. God forgets it, it's like it never happened. That's justifying grace. And then through sanctifying grace, he gives us the chance to look more and more like him, to grow into people whose lives are marked by love and compassion, and kindness, generosity, and gratitude. That's what we're gonna be talking about pretty much the rest of confirmation, what it looks like to grow more and more into the kind of people that Jesus, the good shepherd, longs us to be. But it's all grace. It's all undeserved. We didn't earn it. We didn't do anything to get it. We just have to say yes. We just have to accept it. Will you pray with me? God, we are so grateful for your grace. Where would we be without it? What would we do without this free gift that you have given us that puts us back on the right path to following after you, that doesn't leave us wandering off alone in the wilderness, in our sin, in our broken relationships, in our hurt, in our pain, but you have given us a way to fix the hurt, to fix the broken. 
And that is called grace. And God, we are grateful for that today. Lord, as we break into our small groups, I hope that you would just be in these conversations that we have, that you would just allow us to hear from one another. And Lord, through those conversations that we would hear from you. And Lord, those times when we have wandered off, just allow us to hear your voice calling after us. Allow us to tune in to the voice of our good shepherd that longs to put us on your shoulders and carry us back home. We love you, God, and we are so thankful for you today. We ask it all in your name. Amen.